Welcome to Industries in Chemical Engineering, a series of short videos intended to expose sophomore chemical engineers to the variety of career options available within chemical engineering. I'm your host, Dr. Vijay Toko from the Department of Chemical Engineering at the University of Florida. Just a reminder, all information presented here comes from my own experiences, discussion with engineers in these fields, and my own curiosity. You should expect your experiences in these fields to vary considerably. This is Industries in Chemical Engineering. Episode 7, Agriculture. The agricultural industry is all about optimization and trade-offs. Two key words there at the sweet spot of chemical engineering. Some example companies in this space include Mosaic, Monsanto, Scott's, and American Sugar Refining. Let's start the episode by talking about sugar. Sugar comes from the sugarcane plant that grows well in the warm and humid climate of Florida. Look at this infographic that I found online and notice all the chemical engineering words. Purification, melting, filtering, crystallization, and drying. This is all happening on a large commercial basis, hence the involvement of the chemical engineer. To see this process visually, I highly recommend the How It's Made episode for sugar, which is freely available on YouTube. Let's look at the structure of sucrose, one of the types of sugar molecules, and compare it side by side to sucralose, which you may know by the trade name Splenda. Sucralose can be made from sugar in a multiple step process where three of the OH groups are replaced by chlorines. Other than that, the molecular formulas are identical. I find this incredibly fascinating. The only difference is three atoms, and yet sugar is a substance that tastes delicious, but it is very high in calories, and almost certainly very bad for you if you consume too much. Yet sucralose has zero calories, and is measured to be about 600 times sweeter than sugar. The health effects of excess consumption are not certain, but are quite controversial. Again, how is this possible given that the molecules are so similar? Let's keep going and talk about fertilizer for crop production, or home gardening, or lawn feeding. When you go to the store to buy fertilizer, you need to know which numbers you need, corresponding to N, nitrogen, P, phosphorus, and K, potassium, three elements that are critical for plant health. In this cartoon bag of fertilizer, it is 18N, 24P, and 6K. These numbers don't have units, so I got curious and I looked it up. The numbers correspond to the weight percent of that element. How about that? A weight fraction, just like the ones from class, making an appearance in the real world. Given what you've already learned from class, you know that weight percentages must sum to 100. Therefore, this fertilizer is still 52% something else. Hopefully, it's easy to see how material balances are critical in the manufacture of fertilizer. For more details about fertilizer, there's a TED-Ed video on YouTube that I'd recommend called The Chemical Reaction That Feeds the World. But material balances are not all that's important in the manufacture of fertilizer. It comes in many different forms, including granular and liquid, each having its own advantages, disadvantages, and method of manufacturing. As a quick side note, I've always been astounded by the containers where you hook your garden hose up to the top. I tried one once and just stared at it for 20 minutes wondering how it works how the fertilizer gets into the flow of water, and how it seems to know the proper dilution. I was mystified by it all, and I never figured it out. Kind of related to the idea of fertilizer, a few years ago before I knew how to properly care for my lawn, it got eaten by a swarm of chinch bugs, so I had to replant sod plugs. I wanted to do all the work myself, so of course I made some mistakes and planted the sod plugs too far apart, and crabgrass started growing in between. So then I hired a lawn care company and they came out and sprayed a chemical that killed the crabgrass but not the St. Augustine. This is a photo about a week after the application. The St. Augustine grass is healthy and green while the crabgrass is turning yellow and starting to die. Once again my curious chemical engineering brain kicked in. How does a chemical work that kills some plants but not all? I was teaching separations at the time and remember something I had told my students about separation processes. They all work by exploiting some characteristic difference. This difference can be natural or can be introduced with genetic engineering. Here's an example. Atrazine is one of the most common herbicides, and this map shows exactly how common it is. It works by inhibiting photosynthesis in broadleaf weeds, but not corn. Once again, look at the molecular formula and notice that it's not probably found anywhere in nature, so a chemical engineer has to design the process to make it. Another example is glyphosate, more commonly known as Roundup, which is a brand of the Monsanto company. It works by targeting an enzyme called EPSP synthase that's only found in plants and not animals. The problem is that it will kill crops like corn too, so a common solution is to genetically modify your crops to give them a gene that makes them resistant to glyphosate. 
This brings me to my next topic, which is quite the hot button issue or, of GMOs, or genetically modified organisms. GMOs are great for many things. For example, you can genetically modify tomatoes to increase their shelf life and not bruise, which makes them look great in the produce aisle at the grocery store. But anyone who's ever grown their own organic tomatoes can tell you that there's absolutely no substitute for a fresh, non-GMO tomato. Additionally, some people are very skeptical about GMOs. But I'd just like to point out that genetic modification happens naturally when plants crossbreed. For example, some scientists believe that ancient farmers would cross their crop plants with virus-resistant plants to result in a crop that is virus-resistant. It's just that this method takes a lot of time and has a low probability of working. Modern genetic engineering has gotten very precise and very good. You might have heard about the CRISPR technology and about how it can edit DNA down to the single letter and do it very quickly. I don't have time in this video to cover exactly how it works, but I would suggest looking into it because many people, myself included, think that it can change the world. I have another short and interesting YouTube video recommendation called How Are GMOs Made? The Genetically Modified Hawaiian Papaya Study. Although this video was made in 2013, before CRISPR really began taking off, the principles are similar and fascinating. One final example of how innovation in engineering can improve the world is the emerging sector of plant-based meats, led by two companies that are dominating this sector, Impossible Foods and Beyond Meat. Humans' consumption of meat is becoming a problem for the environment because the process to make meat is quite inefficient and uses a ton of resources. These companies ask the critical question of why does meat have to come from dead animals? Because after all, isn't it just a collection of molecules like everything else? Could we make these in another way? As it turns out, many companies have tried to reproduce the taste and texture of meat with plants before, and the result was these gross tasting, at least to me, veggie burgers from a couple years ago. But as these companies have recently discovered, there was one secret ingredient that was missing the entire time, heme. Heme is the molecule that gives meat its juiciness and satisfies humans' carnivorous instincts. Once you add heme to veggie burgers, it becomes much closer to the animal-based burger and to many people, indistinguishable. One final YouTube plug. Mark Rober made an extremely fascinating video about plant-based meat and the impact that it can have on the world. Titled, Feeding Bill Gates a Fake Burger to Save the World. This one is in must-watch territory. I've recommended plenty of YouTube videos in this episode, so I'd like to close it out by reminding you of the titles that I recommend. See you in the next episode.